Hey guys. How are you? Thanks for joining us. This is our first Google Hangout on air live. Uh, we want to thank Random House for all of their assistance. Uh, incredible help they've given us both with content and with the technology, which is way beyond us. We really want to thank Eleven Sound, which is the sound studio that we're broadcasting from. It's really become kind of like our home away from home. And Google also for all of their help. I'm Barry Michaels. This is Phil Stutz. Between the, between the two of us, we have been shrinking people for about 60 years. <laughs> Seems like longer. That's shattering. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, we published a best-selling book called The Tools on the New York Times bestseller list for nine weeks. If you don't know what a tool is, buy the book. But it's actually a very quick, quick simple technique which, if used over time, helps you find courage, develop your creativity, and your willpower, and as a result, expand your life. Now, once we published the book, we were kind of inundated with requests uh, about how to apply the tools to creative endeavors, and that's why we set up this Google Hangout. So before we start, we just want to talk about two things. Phil and I don't really care that much about theories of creativity, even though we're going to talk about them today. What we really care about is that you walk away from this hangout feeling inspired to do more creatively than you've ever done before. And we'll do just about anything to make you do that. So if you fuck this up, expect us to show up at your door. <laughs> He's very intimidating. So. You can see it. You can tell. Look at me. Now, the other point that, that I want to make before we start is that Phil and I don't think of creativity as limited to uh, artistic endeavors like writing or music or the visual arts. We really think of creativity as something that's essential in every area of life. I'm a parent. Being a parent is one of the most creative things that you can do. If you want your relationship uh, with your spouse to be passionate it requires creativity when you work with co-workers it requires creativity to keep them inspired and to get along with them now we are really privileged today to have some expert participants and I want to introduce them to you they all come at creativity from different angles uh, we have Johanna Hurwitz hey Johanna Hello. Hi, Johanna. hi hi Johanna is a clinical psychologist with a large practice in Manhattan. She uses the tools in her practice and she works extensively with creative people. We have Jim Dutka. Jim? Hello, hello, gentlemen. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Hi, Jim. Well, thank you. Jim owns a real estate company and enjoys a career as a corporate and personal development trainer. He also teaches Sunday school at an Episcopal church. We also have Adam McKay. Adam? Hi. How you doing, Hi, Adam. Adam? Good to be here. Hello, Adam. everyone. Adam's a screenwriter, a director, a comedian. With Will Ferrell, he's co-written some of my favorite movies, Anchorman, uh, the sequel to Anchorman, which is coming out in December, Talladega Nights, The Campaign, and he also co-founded the website Funny or Die, which is an incredibly funny website. We also have Aaron Wilson. Aaron? You there? Aaron. Seem to have lost Aaron. If we can get Aaron back on, that would be great. Uh, Aaron is an award-winning, internationally produced playwright and screenwriter. She is credited with the films uh, Secretary, Fur, and Chloe, and she consults with writers privately in her Santa Monica office and on Skype. And finally, last but not least, we have Bill Wheeler. Bill? Howdy. How you doing? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Great. I've known Bill almost as long as I've known Phil. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long slog. <laughs> a real distinction. Yes. His credits include The Hoax uh, with Richard Gere, the TV miniseries Empire, and most recently the feature film The Reluctant Fundamentalist. Aaron, you're back. Can you hear us? Great. We can't hear you, but hopefully... I can't hear her, yeah. There we go. 
There we go. go. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Good. I Thank the Lord. You gave, you, gave your credits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oh, I missed the best part. All right. All right. <laughs> Shit. We can, can do it over again. Do it again. Right. <laughs> now, all five of you, please interrupt us at any point with questions, points that you want to make. Um, we, we really in, uh, are grateful for your participation, and anything you have to say will be valuable for us. So let's get started. Phil. Let's just say I'm an average guy. I want to be more creative in my life. Maybe I want to write a book. Maybe I'm looking for a creative way to uh, talk to my parents about, to talk to my kids about drugs or something. Where do I look for creativity? Where do creative ideas come from? Well, they come from everywhere and they come from nowhere. Actually, the, the question itself is not framed properly. No offense to you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but, but, you should be aware of this. If you want to know, know in quotes where an idea comes from, you're actually blocking your own creativity. And let me let me just explain that for a minute. Um, ideas come from something that's mysterious, something that's much bigger than we are, something that ultimately we can't completely understand. It doesn't matter what you call it. You know, you, you could call it the unconscious, the collective unconscious, brain plasticity. Whatever you want, but the the dynamics of your relationship with it remain the same. Now, you can't know where the idea comes from. Your job, as any kind of an artist, or just as a human being, is to put yourself in a position where you can get the goodies. In other words, where you can collect the ideas and you don't lose them. You know, one way we talk about that is, and many artists will tell you this, as being a vessel for something that they don't fully understand that's, that's much bigger than they are. Now, Barry, I think, will find a model um, for dealing with creativity that I fully agree with. And the model, just to make it really quick, is think of your unconscious as a being, almost like a person that's living inside you. And think of it as having all the, the feelings, emotions, sensitivity that any living being would have. Now, here's the thing. This being has been trying to talk to you probably all your life. You have not been listening, naughty boys and girls. been trying to talk to you and give you ideas. You have not been listening. So a huge part of what we're going to do tonight, this afternoon, is to teach you how to form a relationship with your unconscious. And it's not so easy as just forming a relationship with a human being that's outside you where, you, you know, most of it is verbal, the unconscious knows you really well, and uh, no offense, but it won't particularly trust what you tell it. I just want to amplify what, what Phil says. When he says, you have not been listening, what he means is that mostly we, in our egos, which is our conscious minds, we care about things in the outside world. How do I look? How do people perceive me? Do they like, you know, the work that I put out, etc.? Um, the unconscious perceives that orientation as a rejection of its ideas. Now, Adam, I wanted to ask you a question because you're um, probably aware that a lot of people get into creativity for the wrong reasons, as a basically a road to money and fame. How does that work out when people do that? You know, basically what I've noticed is anytime you have people that come into creativity looking for some result, whether it's money or fame, uh, right away they struggle. Right away uh, their work becomes mannered, uh, it becomes sort of posing. As a po you don't get that flow at the center of it. Uh, there's a lot of acting books out there that tell people how to network, how to always be putting their 8x10 out there, that it's all who they know. And the great actors and comedians I've known don't really care about that. They just go and do the work that they care about, and it's when you're free of that, that that's when a flow will come, and you're not worried about results. Um, you know, I was thinking, one example was years ago, we did a deal through our production company to do a TV show, and it was strictly because the deal was so good, there was a lot of money with it, and it's the worst thing we've ever done at our production company, it was a total failure. And we really made a vow to never do that again, never chase the deal. 
uh, and to only do things we actually are excited by or we think there's potential. It doesn't mean everything will work out, but our view has been that you only do things you're excited about. And can you feel a difference inside yourself when you stop caring what other people think and are just creative versus that, that project where you were doing it for the money? Yeah, the one where it's for the money, you find yourself struggling a lot more. You find yourself sort of going back to old tricks and old sort of craftsman kind of moves. Well, I know if I create a rise of energy here and then I you know, create disappointment that that'll make the audience do that, you become much more manipulative and much more strategic in your thinking as opposed to when you're doing something because you have to do it then it's purely about the excitement of an interaction with an audience and it's much more of a flow that happens. Uh, so we always try and do that. The, the check-in point is always let's not ever do anything for some sort of strategic reason or because it's career smart. Let's only do it if it really makes us laugh, if we really think there's something here that's worth getting into. Yeah, not to jump too far ahead, but what you said I think is going to be so helpful to the people watching when you said the work is mannered and posing and there's a superficiality to it and there's a calculation to it um, and people in Hollywood are crazy but they're not stupid you know usually they can sense that now the, the, the only reason I'm, I'm picking on that um, piece of information is that that is the description of somebody who does not have the shadow involved in the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So take this sh and we'll talk about exactly what that means you take the shadow out of the process you get something that's smooth literally it's almost like it becomes like a prospectus you get from uh, in, in business or something so later on we get into the shadow that's going to help you understand why it's so important Aaron, you told a story about, I think, a student who came in with kind of a boring pitch that seems like it would be, you know, relevant to this. It's almost like he had the wrong agenda. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, can you hear me well? It, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I was I was teaching, um, the running the graduate program with Paul Vogel at Brown, and, the, and we had these graduate playwriting students, and... Um, they, they had to take, they were required to take a screenwriting class, God forbid, because that was sort of like whoring yourself and um, in their minds. And so this kid came in who's a very good writer, and kid by, I mean by a 30-year-old, and um, told me this story that he wanted to pitch. And I said, it, what, what is that? Why are you doing that? And he said, well, well, it doesn't matter because it's a screenplay. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? And he said, well, I, I don't have to like it, and I don't like it, but, you know, somebody likes it. And he had this sort of anonymous idea, idea of an anonymous Hollywood creature that would like a lot of shit, you know. So he, <laughs> so he you know, would try to come up with the hackiest thing he'd come up with, and it was just absolutely s silliness. And if, if I tried to do that, I, I would, I can't. I don't know how to. And, you know, I wrote Secretary... Uh, because it came from, well, for a variety of reasons, but it came from my heart. And I said to him, look, a screenplay is not something that's out there, that's something else, that is somebody else. It's you. It's close to your skin. It comes from inside of you, and you have to write exactly what turns you on, what makes you excited, what you want to sit with and watch and sit with for many, 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 many drafts and um, so that you don't bore yourself to death and so it, at any rate it, it, that in, in some ways the story is a little bit more about Hollywood and screenwriting about how this misconception that it's something that's out there whereas you can make it you can redefine it for yourself and make it inside yourself yeah that's great that's a great story um, and it and it underscores a point I think that Phil and I are going to come back to again and again which is that when you do that you're selling out the best part of you. You're in essence selling out your unconscious. You're betraying your most precious possession. Now, uh, someone, I think it was Adam, mentioned the word flow earlier, and everybody has at least kind of a vague idea of what flow is. Can you describe flow and what 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 it has to do with creativity? Yeah. Um, if you're going to talk about flow, for me at least, you have to start at the beginning, the bottom line. Flow is a working definition. 
Flow is a mysterious force that's endlessly creating, endlessly creating. It's not creating up to the point where it can buy a condo on the Wilshire corridor. You know, it's not it's not creating so it can get a career and marry the woman you want to impress. It, it's creating endlessly. That's its nature. The other thing to remember is you might create the greatest screenplay ever written or a wonderful piece of art or whatever. Whatever you create pales in comparison to what the macro flow force created. It created you and it created the rest of the universe. So you could say the flow force has bigger ideas than anyone in Hollywood ever had. And I'm saying that seriously, and it was a little bit of a joke. Um, a little, <laughs> nobody's laughing. <laughs> the, the other aspect of this endless creation is it really flow has no intrinsic interest in the results. Whether the result is good or bad, it wants to go on and create something else. Now listen very carefully because one of the themes that we're going to deal with is now that you know a little bit about the nature of flow, in your function as an artist, as a creator, you're going to try to imitate the form that flow takes, the attitude that flow takes. And as you do, you will get more flow, more creative, and you'll be much more satisfied. Um, now, something else you need to know about flow, which is flow is all inclusive by its nature. Whatever is left out, it wants to include. And that's a long discussion why, but I think if, if you felt it, you probably can sense that. Okay? That means flow and what it creates has to include the lowest, the most disgusting, the most repugnant, the worthless. Now, let me tell you a quick story. Carl Jung, who was the um, famous, you know, brilliant psychiatrist that really opened up the dream world and the unconscious, etc., grew up in Basel. Now, if you ever been there, it's in western Switzerland. It's a very, very conservative city, and uh, he came from a family of generations of Protestant ministers. So, needless to say, he came from a very conservative family, and that had a bearing on what happened to him next. He was he was a spiritual little kid. And when he was 13 or 12 or whatever, he was confirmed. He was looking forward to it. And when the ceremony was over, he felt nothing. He felt nothing. Mm -hmm. he, he left the cathedral and he sat on the bank. I think it's the Rhine that goes through Basel. He was sitting on the bank looking at the cathedral, totally crest, crestfallen, crushed. And he started to get this image, like a vision came to him. And he, it was so repugnant he tried to suppress it, he tried to push it away, and he couldn't. Here's what the image was. God, this huge figure, walked into Basel and was standing astride the cathedral where he had just been conf confirmed. God then took a dump <laughs> on the cathedral. God's uh, product was dripping down the walls on all sides. Now here's the thing. Jung was inspired. Jung had his first real spiritual experience right then and there as the great father was dripping down the walls <laughs> of the cathedral. <laughs> now, what does that show you? It shows you that something that the ego, the judgmental mind rejects, not just rejects, but holds as less than worthless, actually is indispensable for flow. Now, I don't know what we're going to do about that in this podcast. Well, I, I, th I, I'll, I'll do something, which is that, you know, to finish the story about the guy is that I think if you don't, for me, if you don't embarrass yourself, if I don't find myself embarrassing myself with what I've written, I haven't been in the flow. Mm -hmm. There's something embarrassing about, about you have, you're, there's an expo exposing that is a little bit embarrassing or or could be you look like an idiot. I mean, it I, it always is the right. I always know it is working well if I am embarrassed. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Flow is exposure. It's like the membrane between you and the outside world. All attempts that you make to look good fly out the window, and all of a sudden you're just out there performing, flying out on a limb, mm -hmm. and that's a that's a, a delicious feeling, but it's also a very frightening feeling that the ego tries to resist with everything that it's got. 
Yeah, and that's where you can pick up this idea of a reverse indicator. A reverse indicator is an unpleasant sensation, where certainly that level of vulnerability would be quite unpleasant, but it connotes progress. It feels like shit, pardon the expression. It's very discomforting. You think you're doing something wrong, but if you can just tolerate the feelings, you can advance yourself, particularly in this area of, of creativity. Frankly, what we tell our patients is if they're not feeling that way every day, they're not really doing their homework. That's how you use a reverse indicator is if I'm not embarrassing myself or at least feeling like I'm overexposed every day, mm -hmm. then I'm not pushing hard enough. Yeah. So it, it seems like that almost, you know, cries out for the subject of the shadow because the shadow is in essence God's shit in that story. Um, a lot of our readers submitted questions about the shadow and most of them were sort of boiled down to what the fuck is the shadow? <laughs> because the it's such an elusive concept and I really empathize with how hard it is to sort of grab onto and, mm -hmm. and hold onto as a concept. So to bring us all up to speed, can you kind of give us a basic working definition of the shadow and explain why is it so crucial to create a flow? Yeah, I, I can try that. Um, here's try doing it without your shadow. <laughs> My shadow won't participate. I have nothing to say. Um, okay, Jung defined the shadow as that which you are but wish you were not, okay? He defined it as a part of you that you don't like, you don't approve of, you don't want other people to see, um, but you can't do anything about it. It's, it's there. That was his definition of shadow. Now, what Barry and I did was, um, let's say, create an aggressive philosophy and also set of tools to bring out the strength in the shadow. Now, originally, when you, when you explain this to somebody, they always say, you want me to take the weakest, most shameful part of me that I've been keeping in a closet for 20 years, and you, you want me to integrate it, and what, really? How, how is that going to help me? So here's the first thing you have to understand about the shadow. You know, who, who here saw Pulp Fiction? Okay. I saw it. Okay. Admit it, you know, you don't have to be ashamed. Anyway, in Pulp, in Pulp Fiction, there's this device, right? There's that um, metallic suitcase or um, attache case. And um, when it's open, it's only open for a second, there's glowing, there's some kind of magical light emanating from the uh, attache case. Then it gets closed again. Now, think about that. Think about if you had one of those attache cases. It's magic. You open it up, and there's this pristine inspiring, empowered light inside it, right? Someone gives it to you, drops it on your doorstep, you've got it, you know it's valuable, but then months go on, years go on, and you start to use it to throw your dirty underwear in there. You might lift it up an inch and throw your socks in. Pretty soon, and then you start to put stuff on the outside of it, pretty soon the light is gone. You don't see the light. All you see is a hamper and not a very neat hamper at that, okay? So that is how the shadow becomes seen as a negative. In other words, the shadow has in it pure light, which for our purposes means pure flow, um, pure ability to create something out of nothing. That's the light, and we cover it up. And the reason we cover it up is we're not honest with ourselves. And there's all these qualities we have. Like, for instance, for me, when I was a kid, I didn't like getting punched in the face or fighting. And I, instead of admitting it and maybe learning how to fight better or whatever, I just took a persona of being very tough, for instance. But really, I was hiding something. And what were you hiding specifically? Like, for, for somebody who's never heard of the shadow mm -hmm. before, tell them what your, your shadow actually looks like. Um, what I was hiding was that I was a crybaby. One time when I was 12, I lived across from a basketball court. I was playing one-on-one -on -one with this guy for a nickel, a nickel, and he beat me. He was an older kid, and I gave him the nickel, and I broke down crying right there. 
I, so that's your shadow. That's my shadow. Yeah, when I work with him, that's what I see as a young crybaby instead of trying to hide that. Any of you guys want to give other examples of your shadow or anybody? I don't want to force anybody. I mean, mine looks like, you know, I had to be nice all the time um, to everybody, very, very polite, you know, to everyone, et cetera, et cetera. My shadow always looks like an extremely angry 15-year-old who basically every single time I, I form an image of him, he's giving me the finger. He's saying, fuck you, asshole. Anybody, not <laughs> anybody else? Well, it, uh, no, I don't, and I don't want to interrupt, but there's also, uh, Phil, three, he was telling me, three shadows, which is, I don't know if that's relevant to this conversation. But Well, I can just touch on it quickly. Um, here's the thing. The crux of the shadow is that you don't find it acceptable. You try to hide it. Okay? The three aspects. The most common is the inferior shadow. I didn't go to the right college. I'm not good looking enough. I don't have enough money. But that's inferior. There's a second shadow called the evil shadow, which you also hide for a different reason. The evil shadow really doesn't give a shit about anything or anybody. It does what it pleases. It's the source. <coughs> excuse me. It's the source of a lot of impulsive um, behavior. You also try to hide it. And then the third and the deepest shadow, we call the sick shadow, and that's the mortal part of all human beings. Every one of us has a shadow that's dying every second, and it just renders us a physical and a temporary physical visitor, so to speak. Um, so those are the three uh, shadows. Now remember, <laughs> without complicating things too much, just remember that the shadow looks bad because you've judged it, you've rejected it, but there's this incredible light underneath. In essence, the shadow is responsible for all of the best ideas that you have and the energy with which you can implement those ideas. So the whole point of working on your shadow is to forge a relationship with it so that those ideas then become available to you. Anybody else want to say anything about that or should I move on to the next subject? Well, uh, I'm, in, I'm in business with uh, real estate and large deals and people with big egos and who own hundreds of millions of dollars of property and I have meetings with these people all the time phone conferences and have to present myself in a certain way such that we facilitate these deals and the shadow that I experience inside is this cringing afraid little person who just doesn't feel part of it and yet the persona outside that I uh, have created is the a confident, uh, responsible person who I want I want to do business with these people, and then there's a little part that says, "Well, can we be friends?" Well, you know what? Sometimes it's just business, and I I get confused with trying to integrate that, and and this, some of this is very clinical and and not not heartfelt interactions, but yet underneath it, you can still love the people. And how does that? How does that inhibit you in the interactions that you have with the with the people that you that you do business with? Uh, for example, I was on a call just the other day when we're in the midst of this very large project, and this guy sort of had a little tone on the phone, and he challenged me a little bit. It wasn't even a lot, and then there's this part of me that just gripped inside of me uh, and had a pause to even just go back and respond and I and I did fine but I I just wanted to be more in the in the flow of it and not be so reactive to the the tone or his challenge the shadow got gripped with what fear it was fear it was com comparison um, envy uh, I'm not experienced enough uh, you might have to put you on the spot do you mind if we work with you for a minute um, uh, let's go for it Great. Close your eyes. And all of you out there, do this with him. In other words, he's kind of exposing himself here. So, you know, we want to be on his side and be supportive of him. So do this inside yourselves. 
just look at that shadow figure inside of you. He's cringing. He's fearful. He's scared. Can you see him? Yes. Great. Now, just like Phil said, remember that he is the source of the best ideas, the light. Anything that has ever helped you in life has come from him. And he's also given you the energy with which to succeed with those ideas. And yet constantly, consistently, you care more about what other people think of you than you do about what he gives you. Now turn to him, look him in the eye, and without going into a paroxysm of guilt or self-flagellation, just simply apologize to him. I'm sorry for not being your friend. I'm sorry for considering you an outsider and an enemy. I'm good. sorry I'm ashamed of you. Good, good. Now we'll go one step further. I want you to make a commitment to him. And I want it to be a very solemn commitment that this ends now. Moving forward, you never shame him or judge him again. The two of you are a team. He says, you've made that commitment many times and broken it. I don't trust you. Tell him. You have no reason to trust me because I have broken that commitment many, many times, and yet I'm still making the commitment now. And if I break it again, I'll make it again. There's such a gulf to reel it in, to make it real, to make it stick. He really doesn't trust you. Is that what you're saying? It's... It's been an on and off relationship. Yeah. Yeah. But he's open. He is open. There's a glint in the eye and he's open. Good. Okay, you can open your eyes. Jim, thank you. I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but that was really, no. really helpful. I'm crying and my life force is here. One thing I want to add to that, when you're forming that bond, at the moment you're forming it, you want it to be to feel so powerful, so profound that it blocks out everything else. For that moment, there's nothing in the universe but you and your shadow. I usually create like almost like a field of blinding light, so I can't see anything else. By the way, that's a definite one of the definitions of flow is the moment that something invisible becomes more real than the outside world you're in flow because your invisible world has come to life. It was a feeling of what was two is is now one. Yes. Yeah, that's good. That's beautiful. Cool. Do you work with um, Do you work with the uh, the evil shadow in the same way you do with the inferior shadow? Um, you can. Um, Usually when you're working with the evil shadow, um, the problems are different than, than, what they are with the, huh? than what they are with the inferior shadow. Um, the evil shadow can function in the face of social norms or social conventions. It, it can do things in, in effect that you can't do. Yeah. Um, it, it freaks people out because it also doesn't have the concerns for other people and in some way they, even concerns for rules and regulations that we, as civilized, so-called civilized people, we like to think that we have. Just to give you some examples of it, I had a patient who, when he was five years old, took all his clothing, five years old, this was, threw it in the bathtub and lit it on fire. Now, that was his evil shadow. Um, I, I, once, um, I, I once threw an ice ball at this girl. I was probably 10, and she had done nothing at all, and I just missed mm -hmm. taking out her eye by maybe a quarter of an inch, just just missed it. Mm -hmm. And my father was 
beside himself from, he wasn't violent, but he gave me one or two shots, and he made me go over to the house and uh, apologize. But the, the point was, I didn't know where this was coming from at all, because it was coming out of my unconscious. People that are iconoclasts, people that can get new ideas into the world, um, that can um, set themselves up for big challenges, usually have a strong evil shadow. Mm -hmm. The bad news is they're usually impossible to get along with. The, the good news is they're, they're closer to these superpowers that we're always talking about mm -hmm. uh, than the more conventional uh, you. So, as the ego, part of your thing is when you're talking to your evil shadow is to say, I, me, the ego, I am willing to accept the disapprobation, the criticism, the judgment, basically being accused of being evil. Um, I'm willing to accept that for the purpose of bonding with you. But bonding mm -hmm. with the shadow always depends on the shadow feeling. You can feel what they've had to feel. I think when I was thinking, I was just saying when I was thinking about my shadow, I think it was my evil shadow that I came up with and saw uh, myself when I was maybe about eight um, on a diving board in a public pool, and there was this little kid in front of me who kept running up to the end and then chickening out and coming back, and I was getting really frustrated. And so when the kid was at the end of the diving board, I ran up and bounced on it, so the kid went flying off the diving board into the pool. Mm. Mm. That's definitely an evil shadow moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things I think that's really interesting about the evil shadow, the way it applies to creativity, is that um, that same impulse of, like, out oh, of hell with you, to hell with the kid on the diving board. This sort of, like, like throwing off of everything for me tends to be a precursor of entering something that is meaningful, something that's similar to flow inside the creativity. And you hear that from people. Like um, when Henry Miller wrote Tropic of Cancer, he talks about how he had worked so hard on this novel that he had written, and he for years he slaved over it, and he worked so hard on it, he put out, you know, every, all, wanted it to be the best novel there ever was, and essentially it was rejected. No one wanted it. And so he was so furious and so rejected and so upset that he said, fuck it. I'm going to write a book that is just going to be like a fuck you to the world. And that book was Tropic of Cancer. And so I think that there is this dance we have to do with these forces in order to sort of harness them and use them um, in this kind of sublimated way that's, that, that is really intrinsic. Um, can be really intrinsic to the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautifully put. Here's the thing that shrinks that we face, which is usually it's with younger artists, younger writers, directors. They they misunderstand what you just said. I mean, they want to do something original. They want to be outside the box. They want to be known to be on the cutting edge, etc. They can few, and that's a way of functioning creatively and psychologically and intellectually. But they confuse that with wearing black or wearing shades inside right. or getting out of ink. That's, those things are what we call a perverse lower version of a higher principle. Mm -hmm. So the, to use it artistically takes courage. To act it out, which is, um, you know, Adam alluded to it in a different way, is basically superficial. And uh, that was one of the questions that, uh, that have come up. So there's a, there's a saying about that, which is, I think it says, create like you're a thief or a bandit and live like you're a monk. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe yeah, it just describes my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I liked what Bill was saying about, um, sorry, I'm not in the frame, anger. It says anger. Uh, and, and you're talking about young people in black who often haven't been pressed to the very end of their uh, ability to cope with uh, the world. But right. it can happen when you're older, when you've just had it up to here, and you can have a really lovely breakthrough when you give up. I, I had a moment like that uh, where no one 
I was having a lot of trouble in New York theater. And so I said, fuck it. Uh, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And I started, so I started to write a pornographic novel. And, um, and I thought, no one's ever going to read this. And I'm just going to do what I want. And, you know, this opened a huge door for me, um, which I won't go into all the sequence of events, but it led to something called the erotica project that I did and then to secretary. But it, 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 it was, I honestly just did the crap I want to do. And it was embarrassing, um, but but it was the anger that led to it. It was the evil shadow, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I actually had an exact similar experience, uh, and it was also around creating something that became a huge door opener for me, which is very simply had to do with, you know, again, I had spent years working on these screenplays that were good boy screenplays, you know, they, they, they were, you know, very well told and thought out and they were, you know, had the, the highs in the right places and, you know, and I hit a rejection point, I hit a point of, of where everybody was saying they're well written but I, we don't see you in them, where is your voice, we don't know what your voice is. And it, you know, essentially led me to a kind of a, you know, breakdown where I just get, I was like, I, to hell with all of this, like to hell with you people, to hell with writing, and I'm just going to write about this stupid day job that I have, telemarketing and trying to sell people things. And I wrote a script about telemarketing, and that was the one that everybody finally seemed to like. Hmm. Yeah. And you'll hear this over and over again, stories yeah. that, 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 that creative people tell about this happening. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, it's very important just, again, for people who are not familiar with the concept of the shadow, particularly the evil shadow, we're not condoning evil shadow behavior, we're telling you that the part of you that behaved that way, maybe when you were younger and didn't have as much impulse control or whatever, that part of you has a special energy, it's like a fuck you energy, and you need that energy as an adult in order to be a creative person who's free, free of caring what other mm -hmm. people think, free of the concerns for the marketplace, free to really say what you want to say. I, yeah, I, I, think it. I think it's essential. I think every shadow that we're talking about are the characters that populate all creative works, whether it's the evil shadow, mm -hmm. whether it's the vulnerable shadow, Without yeah. accessing these types of shadows, I don't think you have creative work. I think they're the absolute ground floor of it. Um, you know, the evil shadow, it was interesting you were talking about these characters that bring so much originality into the world. And I just saw that doc, uh, that documentary, Ginger Baker. It's called, like, the awful Ginger Baker or something, and it's the drummer from Cream wow. back in the 60s. And he's really horrible the entire time. Like, mm -hmm. you do not want to be around this guy Yet every stage of his career is completely breaking ground. Uh, and I think you're talking about Pulp Fiction. I mean, every character in that movie is a shadow. Uh, it's a different side of a shadow without accessing this. Certainly in comedy, all comedy characters are shadow characters. They're either a uh, neurotic Albert Brooks character or it's, uh, you know, an evil ne'er-do-well uh, or it's a... Uh, you know, Groucho Marx type guy who doesn't care about anyone who's one giant middle finger. Uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely essential mm -hmm. to access these characters. Adam, could I ask you something? Yeah. Uh, since you obviously know this material so well and it feels like it's pretty natural for you, before you did any of this work, when you were younger, do you know how you were able to because you probably didn't know the terminology, but how were you able to plug in and, in quotes, see this and, and maybe bring it to fruition artistically? I'm talking about the people's shadows. Well, you know, we were talking about sort of those creative breakthroughs you have early in your life. Uh -huh. And for me, it was working with a group in Chicago called the Upright Citizens Brigade. And we just did street theater, we did prank theater, and that was really the breakthrough for me, where it was a group that there was no way we were going to make any money out of it. Uh, I did a show where I advertised my own suicide all around the city of Chicago, <laughs> and then actually stood on top of a five-story building with an audience in the street and threw a CPR dummy off of it. Were they yelling, jump? 
took an audience back to my apartment and acted out a murder scene in my apartment and left the audience in the streets. And it was one of the freest, greatest times I ever had. And it just released everything. There was no way we were ever going to get paid. Later, I left the group and did get a paying job. And now the group is actually still around and quite successful. But the initial beginning of it, the spirit was always, we will never make a dime from this. We're just doing it because we love it. And I always felt like that was sort of the creative breakthrough for me and, and the long-form improvisation scene in Chicago, which is another way to not get paid. Uh, you know, next to poet, there's no lower-paying job on planet Earth than improviser. Uh, and that, that two- or three-year period for me was really just like a creative, you know, opening that happened where none of it was about results, none of it was about getting paid, and everything sort of came from that time. Yeah, I think that's really a gift for the younger people watching this, to hear that story. Um, and, you know, as Barry said at the beginning, and we want to hold on to it as a theme, we're crazed about pushing people to the limit and beyond the limit of their abilities, particularly creative people. And one of the biggest weapons we have is this sense of reverse indicators so what you, the story you told was pretty extreme, and to do it, to get there, to get way outside the box, to get out on the limb, to get deep into your instincts and unconscious, however you, way you want to say it, you had to pass through reverse indicator land. In other words, it may have been just anxiety-provoking and scary. It may have been humiliating for, for you. You may have felt guilty throwing people out windows, and probably not. <laughs> whatever, whatever these these reverse indicators are, they're like guideposts to tell you that you're going in the right direction. And and one of the things that I think Adam, you you can tell me if I'm right about this, but one of the things that I think is really important for young people to know is that the reverse indicator actually becomes more acute the older and the more successful you get, because when you're young, you can do things like that. There's nothing at stake. But when you've achieved any measure of success or any kind of reputation, to keep it fresh, to keep it new, you have to really risk exposure and failure in a way that's much more acute than when you're young and unsuccessful. Yeah. And do you know the best way to ensure that you're going to do that? You need a peer group, which is a whole other thing for us. But you need a couple people who know what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm and who are hopefully trying to do it themselves and then you make that a shared value, you make that part of the ethos of the group, it's very powerful. Um, we're trying to organize that now. Right? Yeah, tools groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, we got time I think for one more topic which is the process of creativity. Um, there are really kind of three stages in this process when you're trying to create something, the first thing you hit is how do I get started? Because we all have a tremendous tendency to procrastinate. Um, in fact, very, very early in my career, this was even before I met Phil, I was treating a young guy who was a writer. He had written like short films and stuff, not successfully, and he'd written a short script that he wanted to direct. It was going to be like a 15-minute, you know, short film. But he was scared, and he kept coming up with all kinds of excuses why he couldn't proceed. I need to tinker with the script. Maybe I don't have the right camera, et cetera, et cetera. This is before I met Phil, so I was actually trying to analyze why he was procrastinating with him. It was a complete waste of time. One day, his uncle insists on coming to the therapy. His uncle, it turns out, is... <laughs> paying for the therapy, that's why he wants to come to see how he's wasting his money. <laughs> paying in five dollar bills. Yes. It also turns out that his uncle is actually in the mafia. Um, he walks in, unsmiling, he sits down on the couch like this, and he just looks at me like death in his eyes. <laughs> so I'm talking, you know, procrastination, analyzing it with his nephew, and I can see this guy is getting ready to explode. All of a sudden, he goes, I don't get it. Uh. You buy a camera. Uh. You point it at somebody. You push the button. Uh. It ain't fucking brain surgery. Uh. <laughs> so I pissed my pants. But the nephew, my patient, 
went out the next day, directed that film, and become an, became an extraordinarily successful mm -hmm. director. Mm -hmm. So the lesson from all of this is never invite the person who's paying for the therapy into the session. <laughs> <laughs> now, the lesson is you learn much more by doing than by thinking. And sometimes you just have to start. You can't get everything worked out in advance. If you could, there would be no need for creativity. Right. Want to say anything else about that? Um, well, I've been procrastinating trying to avoid it. <laughs> here's the thing. Creativity hurts because you're giving birth. It hurts. It'll hurt at the beginning. It'll hurt in the middle. It'll hurt in the end. Well, that's not the only thing you'll feel, obviously. But anybody that goes into it with the conscious or surreptitious goal to reach the point where there's no pain is going to have a real problem. So the question is, if once you've accepted that, how do you process the pain? Not so much that it'll go away, but so it won't stop you. And both of us are very big on preparation, and we're very big on assuming the worst, and then trying to create tools and procedures so that the worst doesn't stop us, so to speak. Um, so the first pain, you know, by the way, sitting down and starting something is a transition. Coming home from work and talking to your spouse is a transition. Coming home from vacation is a transition. You know, there's millions of transitions. We deal with them badly. The reason we deal with them badly is uh, there's always the unconscious hope that time will stop moving, the clock will stop ticking, and I won't have to make the transition because the transition requires a shift or a change. It takes energy and work, et cetera. Tell them how you get through the pain, though, of starting or when you're in the middle and you've lost your inspiration for the thing and you have to keep going. How do you get through that pain? Well, there's two parts. The one part is the philosophy of it. And listen very carefully to this. I don't train, and Barry doesn't train people to say, I'm really successful, I'm a star, I'm this, I'm that. Nor do we want them to beat themselves up and say, I'm shitty, I have no talent, I'm a bad person. What we want is the self-definition that says, and this is very carefully, I'm the one who uses the tools. I'm the one who uses the tools when I'm winning. I'm the one who uses the tools when I'm losing. And I'm the one who uses the tools for the rest of my artistic life, which hopefully will be for the rest of your life. Um, what that does is creates a conduit. It's, it's almost like a, a wormhole in the universe where you can live and keep on creating. So that way, if, for instance, let's say something bad happens, the person who's unprepared is quickly going to say, woe is me, I don't have the talent, I'm going to, they always say I'm going to quit and be a school teacher and move back east, whatever the typical thing is. We don't, that's not helpful for us, even if they don't move. What's helpful is to say, I got, maybe wrongly or rightly, I got rejected this time. I got a bad result. My identity says I'm the one who's always working and using the tools. So as soon as I possibly can, which should be by tomorrow, I want to be back on that course. Not because the next project will be more successful than the current project. It's because you need to be in that mode. That mode of endless creativity is the nature of the universe. It sinks you up. Um, you guys you guys want to say anything about getting through the pain of starting, finishing, sticking to things? I know you guys have had have lots of experience with that. Well, there's something you and I talked about, Barry, a long time ago, um, uh, which is an idea that you had called arbitrary use of time. And um, that has been very, very helpful for me. Because um, I think that what happens is very often, if you know, we want to write. We have this notion we want to write. Really, what we want is to be a writer, um, without ever having to actually write. Most often, there you, go. There you, we would, you know, we, we, we'd like to put the hat on, you know, and 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 pose for ourselves. But the actual sitting down is very, can be very painful. And I think that the reason it's painful is because universally, all of us, when we sit down believe I'm empty, I have no talent, I have nothing valuable to say, this is just an exercise in banality that I'm engaging in right now. But 
what I've found is the arbitrary use of time just says that, okay, well, if I am talentless and it's all banality, I just have to accept that, and for some reason I want to write anyway. So I'm going to assign this particular period of time, this two hours or whatever, three hours, whatever you have, and no matter what happens, I'm going to honor that commitment to that time that is my writing time. It's like there's a shop, like you're a shopkeeper. This is another thing you told me, Barry. Um, you, op you have regular office hours. You have regular times when you open the shop and regular time when you close the shop, but you have no idea whether customers are going to come in or not. So you may not get a great idea. You may not get you know, the amount of pages you want to get or the song that you want to create. It's a matter of if you are faithful to those hours, the customers will start coming. And, and that's, that's been very helpful to me over the years, just, just putting my ass you know, on the couch or in the chair or in the room and just being in that space of not knowing, being in that space of not knowing whether I'm talented or not, not knowing whether I have an idea or not, and just suffering through that, and it inevitably gives way to flow, I've found. That's great. Let me tell you a quick story about that true story. I lived across the street from the park when I was a kid, and I, I used to walk through the park to get home from school. At 3 o'clock every afternoon, there was this old woman. She would sit in the exact same place on this bench on 74th Street. At the end of the bench, she'd have a big bag of breadcrumbs, which she would throw out you know, around her. And usually there'd be about, I would say, a couple hundred pigeons, you know, these nasty-looking flying rats. But, you know, they have to eat, too. And she'd feed them. This was every day. She was very um, faithful and consistent with it. One day, I walked past there. She's not there. You know who was there? The pigeons. The 200 pigeons. <laughs> they were still there. She had established pigeon credibility. <laughs> <laughs> okay? She was consistent and disciplined in showing up. Now, what if the, the pigeons were ideas? It's the exact same thing, and through consistency and the arbitrary use of time is, uses that premise or that principle, you're going to get more pigeons. And it, it may fail you for a week or a month, but over long periods of time, it won't, it won't fail you. What I just want to amplify what Phil is saying. When, when Phil taught me the arbitrary use of time, what I, what I realized, and you might have actually explained this to me at the time, was that by showing up, I was really telling the unconscious that I'm open and that I value anything that it gives to me. And my willingness to show up day after day after day, even if it gives me nothing, is my part in the relationship with the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And it never fails to come through eventually. Yeah, there's so, a lot of, I use a lot of tools to deal with this, this idea of what, that you were talking about, Bill, about, you know, uh, sitting down to write. Well, I just don't sit down. That, so uh, <laughs> Often I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> because it, if, I, I, if I sit down at a desk, I do feel empty, so I sort of have to just ooze into it, um, usually from waking, and I often end up writing in bed, which is very bad for your back and neck, but... The, the point being that you do it the way that you do that you need to do it, um, and you and however odd that may look to the outer world, or you may think it is, you just do it your own way, and you create your own situation where the muse will come to you. I think also in a, one of the other tools that I use is um, okay. Now I'm going to write really badly, and then um, that makes it really easy too, because then I just I have the permission to be as bad as I want to be, and I can do it for two hours, and inevitably something good will come of that. Um, I can trust that. Um, and the other thing that we were talking about uh, over email was gestation, the idea of writer's block as, uh, I, I call it a time of gestation, where your subconscious is putting together ideas, creating stories, and you're sitting there going, shit, I'm not writing, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I I'm, I'm feel guilty. And if you go, no, the ideas are churning inside of me, generally once you realize, oh, I'm just developing an idea and I don't even know it in my subconscious, and you just stop wasting your time worrying, you can sit down. You have to just get rid of that judge that, that says, you're not doing it, you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's why people drink and take drugs. <laughs> yeah. To write. Yeah. Actually, you know, just to piggyback on that, um, 
I have a motto for writers, for professional writers. And by the way, my thesis is the only difference between a professional and an amateur is a professional can't quit because they've got to pay the mortgage, whatever. Usually the amateur has another job. Anyway, the um, motto or the saying is keep writing shit stupid. That's the whole thing. So keep writing means the willfulness and the discipline to keep going in the face of adversity. Shit means it's absolutely acceptable um, to have Jung's experience. It's actually desirable. The What you think is shit could be very, very valuable. If you won't write because you think it's shit, you're out of the game. So even if you're a professional, you have to not just be ready to write things that you don't consider great. You, you have to actually be an enthusiast about writing shit. And the last thing stupid means don't be so smart. You don't really know the value of what you're writing at any given moment, nor do you know what's going to happen with it. Yeah. Um, when Barry and I got the idea for Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. God help you. That's the nut trick, though. Oh, yeah. That's the sequel to the tools. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a different kind of tools. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I think our time is up. Um, the five of you are fantastic. Yeah. We really appreciate your help. You are you. You're great people. You're great creators. We really appreciate your contribution to all of you who are listening, who we can't see but who can see us. Thanks so much for tuning in. And please remember the bottom line. We've talked a lot about theories. Phil and I don't give a shit about creative theories. What we care about and what we try to infuse into every psychotherapy session we give is an enthusiasm for the process of creating and an insistence, an insistence that people push themselves farther creatively than they think they can go. Now we can't do psychotherapy with all of you, but you don't need us. You can push yourselves to go farther than you think you can go. And if you do, you'll be rewarded with a flood of ideas, information, and the energy to implement them that you never thought was possible. Thanks again, and I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.